Hello, hello, and welcome to another wonderful episode of Submitted for Your Approval, the weekly card review show for Collective, the community-created card game where you make the cards. Today, Grief had to step away. He had a work thing. He's, you know, out there being important and essential in Germany or something. And so we actually do have a guest for you today. Filling in for Grief is Spike Bird. Hello, hello, hello. I've been here before. Oh, uh, so he's got a one up me. He's got the third hello. And... um. <laughs> We are also joined uh, by my loyal uh, panelist, Empty Folder. Hello, everyone. Okay. And uh, without any further ado, let's jump straight into it with the accepted submissions, starting with Soft Heart Hard Shell, which is a two-drop spirit 1-3 slug from nowhere in particular with Regenerate. When this blocks, this has plus two HP and minus one attack until the end of the turn. So I thought this is really, really sort of just an interesting take on Stumpling. Um, I really wanted to talk about it mostly because I think this is Sunbird 1002's first card, so congrats. Uh, what do we think of this? I'll let you start, Spike. Um, I actually don't really have that much to say about the card. It's a good card. It's effectively, like, if you're blocking with it, it's a 0-5 regenerator for two mana, which is, you know, that's good stats, but also it's a 1-3 in the meantime, so if it gets too impressive, oppressive for whatever reason, which I don't, I don't think it will, you could still get rid of it, but I, I think it's a cute design. I don't really yeah. have much to say about it. It's it's correct. It's correctly designed. It's a cute design. Yeah, it's tribal. cute. It's cute and it's simple, and I, I really like that. Uh, people were thinking it was like a, oh, have you really innovated too much on stumpling? Um, this still does maybe have some spot in the um, maybe finding a different way to give it that uh, extra point of attack, so it could always deal the damage. I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Empty? Uh, I really like the idea behind the design. I just think that, like, at this cost with the stats, it's not really going to see any play. Because, mm. like, it like this can't kill anything. And you can't really use it to get, like, dots passive because it's not actually an 05. Like, yeah. it shrinks down, and then you can't use it for that. And a lot yeah, of the so time, like... With Stumpling, you use it to pick off like one health tokens and things and then regen up. You just can't do that with this. Yeah. So actually, yeah, I kind of see your point that one might actually argue this is actually weaker than uh, it, it, Stumpling. It, it is a cheap regenerator. I would like to point that out. And we don't have many of those in standard right now, especially with the rotation happening. Yeah, so there's something maybe to be said, like I said, about especially with the rise of the uh, green equipment. Um Finding some way to use this as just your base regenerator to build on top of. Um, so we'll see. The Null Phoenix is a three drop mine 2 2 bird hallucination from Hallucinogenica, Realm of the Abstract, and one of Stranger's least favorite realms. Flying, agile. When you banish this from your deck, pay two mana if you can to create a copy of this. So if you scoured away, it just pops up. Mm -hmm. That is actually kind of an interesting concept. Uh, uh, this is actually empty uh, pimping Spike Bird's card, I see. Uh, yeah. Well, because <laughs> Before this is I knew space... Spike Bird was going to be the guest. Yeah. <laughs> well, because it's, it's interesting to think about stuff like this because Banish Interaction is super weird in our game due to some stuff with the rules engine as it's implemented right now and the lack of like the Banish Bind distinction and stuff like that. So there are only a couple ways you could legit interact with Banish that don't break the rules in some horrifyingly grotesque way. This is one of those ways. And getting a flaw... Uh, this seems like an interesting like extra benefit to get out of Scour. And mm -hmm. just, man, this is neat. Uh, Empty, what do you think of this? Yeah, I really like this design and like the fact that Spike Bird found a way to like, like doing Banish Synergy is really hard just because of how many things it breaks. Mm -hmm. And Spike Bird really found a way to ride that line and make a, a Banish Synergy card that doesn't break anything. Yeah. Well, there's um, <clears throat> usually when designing th th these type of things, then I guess you could treat this as like a little mini PSA. Um, for any any designers who are looking to get in this game or already in this game, but for well, you know, veteran designers, they know that if you do anything with free banish, like this originally was a free banish, 
um, with smaller stat lines, but if it was a free banish that automatically breaks with uh, certain cards that banish cards from the beginning of the game. Um, mirror match. Yeah. Mirror match, uh, mutant labs, all a bunch of stuff like that. So I try to, I suppose if you just attach a mana cost to it, mana cost is probably the easiest way to do it. Really? It's just yeah. making sure you automatically pay it. Um, so the idea of it was supposedly, you know, it's on relatively on curve, maybe like half a stat point when you play it at three, but when you scour it, you get a, get a discount in the addition of you know you're getting a free cast off your your scour which was mostly the main idea well um, in this particular combination of keywords the flying agile is a good way for like ash to maybe get in a passive proc or just getting a little bit of reach here and there so this particular this has utility all throughout the game uh so i don't even feel bad if this is maybe a little bit under because this is always going to be a thing i want to that's mostly what the intention was. There, there was a similar card in Magic, uh, Narcomiba, which basically yeah. did the same thing, but it was a 1-1 one, one flyer that just put itself into play when you milled it. But you really can't do that in this type of game. Yeah. And not only that, that, there's a bunch of other things that would make that card better that doesn't exist in Collective. So I just try to retool it and just... I, I, I When we were trying to talk about birds, actually, we were thinking about doing like a scour bird tribal. So consider this like... That'd be really cool. Puzzle. That'd be cool. And I think our last for the accepted is the Overflowing Ooze, which is a three-drop Spirit 2-4 Ooze from Mortstall, Realm of the Dead Things, with Overrun, and when an ally with an Entomb dies, this gets plus one, plus one. So we can't go a week without talking about two of the most prolific designers in the game. We talked about Spike, now we got to talk about Corn. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so this is building on the oozes of Mortstall, which are trying to build up this entomb based idea but this is interesting because it's not an entomb it's a meta entomb basically um and it gets bigger and bigger the more oozes that well you probably have a lot of oozes but maybe just entomb units this is potentially really really neat um what do you think of this, Spike? <clears throat> well, I since uh, I it, it might be a little bit self you know gratifying that I picked this card mostly because me and Corn have been trying to kind of like subtly without really talking to each other about it. This more so this he posts a card a week, I post a card like a week later in response to that that type of like back and forth, and uh, I think that this is a really good foothold for an identity that we can have for a new interesting tribe that we can have because currently right now. We don't really have that many good in tombs, but now that we're getting more in tombs, we also need the support, and I think this can go a long way with making it right. I don't think it'll see play exactly right now, but I think a little bit further down the line that it'll be a be a, yeah. be a staple in some deck. Yeah, this this and mortar mockery um, are are starting to build up an engine. I do think it's interesting how if it weren't for Marie, and Marie's not doing too good in the meta, if I recall correctly. Um, Entomb is the fairest trigger, right? Because now we have ways to even cheat summons, but most of your ways to do an Entomb are to die. So we had recently. Well, yeah, but wagered. yeah, there's there's a but even that has to die in order to do the thing, right? No, it's, it, that beats summon. It's summon, summon trigger, trigger and entomb, entomb. entomb trigger or summon. Yeah, okay. Deadbeat is yeah. the only card in the game that does that triggers entombs without it actually properly dying. But yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot more fair ones, and I think we could afford to really maybe play around with them. Um, what do you think of this, Empty? Uh, I kind of think like this is going to fulfill the same role as Mortar Mockery Ooze in this theoretical Entomb deck. Uh, the thing is, I think a lot of the time this is going to fulfill that role worse, as plus one, plus one usually isn't going to be as good as uh, like getting the units in Tombs. And, like, of course, if your opponent removes this, that benefit is gone. Whereas with Mortar Rockery, if, like, you still get it if they remove it. Yeah. Um, but, like, if that deck needs more payoffs, this is a pretty good one. And it can chunk in for a lot of damage if your opponent can't deal with it quickly. Still gets really huge if you Grave Rave with, with it on board, if I recall. Yeah. Actually, yeah. does that work? 
I um, it, it since you know it... Belfry, I know Belfry has a weird interaction with it, but I think if Belfry works with it, then I think Overflowing Ooze would get all the triggers. Yeah, I think that works. Yeah, um, uh, to it. anyone who's building that deck, test that interaction because <laughs> that could end up really poorly if you have to do it in a game. Yeah, yeah, put it in tested card creator first. Okay, now let's talk about the uh, active submissions. Starting with the Neon Jinx, which is a part of the design competition. This one has a very interesting theme, and it is French Vanillas, which means you are restricted using Can't Attack, Can't Block, and anything in the random keyword pool. And Frenzy X, and that's it. Neon Jinx is a two-drop mind, one-one Fia Win Trickster from Aesthetica with Rebound, Ambush, Deadly, and Ward. Now, the first time I was reading this, I thought, oh, keyword soup, and I almost glazed over it. I went back and I read it, and I was like, oh, <laughs> this is actually, like, borderline scary, but it has some classic, like, problems. I don't know if this card's actually too powerful, because it has rebound, and it has ward. That alone usually means this is going to be something very, very, very sticky. But on top of that, he has ambush and deadly. Um, so this card is like, I am going to try as hard as I possibly can to two for one you, basically. <laughs> and I'm going to have to work a long, a long, hard way to do it because I only have one HP, but I'm going to see if I can pull this off. And I think it reasonably could. And this is actually a really, first of all, stunning art and just really, really interesting effect. So I want to know what you think about it, Spike. Um, so when I first saw this, uh, and I guess, I guess partially so right now. I think this still needs to have like one of the keywords on this cutoff personally. But other than that, uh, I think it's interesting that it works really well with flickering if you think about it. Because if I, if I recall correctly, if you flicker it and it creates itself back in play, then it comes back with rebound and ward on top of that. No, it will not regain a rebound. Rebound is a permanent uh, loss. I think it might regain the ward. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, it, well, it, I think with blank that it will at least. Well, you can at least flicker it, and you it would get back the ward, and also it'd still be able to block with ward and deadly. Really, the biggest tragedy that's not like sorted by ward, ambush, re rebound, and deadly. So the acronym spell out ward again. Right now, <laughs> the spell is r rad w. <laughs> hey, rad w sounds very aesthetic. Whatever that is. Um, I'm, I'm going to download some Rad W onto my software when, I get, when I'm done with this. Yeah, this should be Neon Rad W. No. <laughs> Anyways, uh, jokes aside, MP, what do you think of this? Yeah, this is basically like a nightmare for any mid-range deck. It's like, it trades so easily into your stuff. And it takes so much removal to actually like answer this thing. Because you need to play four spells in order to get through a ward and rebound. Uh, I agree with Spike. This, I think this could lose a keyword. The, the thing about it, one last thing I would like to add is that the thing, I, I could see the thought process for every single one of these keywords, right? Because it is a two drop unit that's a one one and you don't want to get popped with vicious stare, obviously. So if it didn't have ward, you'd be able to vicious stare, replay it, vicious stare it again, which is, you know, it's a feel bad. If it had ward, same problem. But with both of them, it just it it feels it feels weird. I think honestly, cut the ambush is probably the keyword I would cut here. If you want to keep the design and you want to have it be playable against stuff like vicious stare. Or the other thought would maybe be to uh, remove the ward and bump the HP up by one to compensate. I mean, honestly, that's practically the same because most of the time you're going to be using like pings to get rid of it. Yeah. Well. Good point, yeah. Yeah, I think it, it's interesting how it looks. I feel like this is, at the very least, push maybe a bit busted, but it's interesting how you actually have to think through the gameplay implications to actually understand why. Um, it's designed I, deliberately. It's not keyword soup. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so ju just the interaction of those is just super interesting. And I would be interested in seeing... What I would be interested in seeing this get in and then seeing what we did to update it. Um, but <laughs> I'm probably alone in that camp, so let's move <laughs> on. I wanted to take an effort to highlight uh, with a couple of my picks this week a lot of the new designers that have been around the sub. 
And the first one is Tricoon with Familiar of Me, which is a one drop neutral zero one cap from Black Rift with Rebound Ward and your non-native cards cost one less to a minimum of one. So I talked about getting, uh, we talked about before Portal Beast Tamer. I know we at least did off screen. Uh, but so this is just another take on that and is trying to give Kyung Mi access to an early way to get her tokens out despite her constantly switching affinities. Uh, Empty, what do you think of this design? Um, I think this is quite strong at what it does. Uh, obviously, this is going to be like an auto include in any fusion project list because that's just ridiculous. Oh yeah. my god. Uh, but on top of that, uh, the first thing I think of actually is food. This is really strong there. Mm -hmm. uh, turn one, you play this, and then turn two, you can go Hydraxy Grunts. No, what? Those are all free. Minimum of one. Oh, minimum of one. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. It's well thought out. <laughs> Yeah, the more. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, Without that, I, I think it's pretty much fine. Mm -hmm. Fusion Project is a bit of a thing, but. Yeah. Yeah, that's whatever. It's Fusion Project. But it's Fusion, Fusion Project. Project already has to deal with most of its units being really, really expensive. So maybe yeah. it deserves to be the special boy here. I think, honestly, Belfry is a bigger. Uh, uh, Belfry of the Void's a bigger problem, maybe, in Fusion Project than this. I mean, Fusion Project, uh, like, that deck has never really been more than a, a meme deck. So yeah, it's a meme deck. I think anyway. it's totally fine to give it a boost. Yeah. I, I'm not sure on this card, truth be told. I, I don't... I understand that it's supposed to be a KM, KM card, and, I'm, and trust me, I'm not going to go on the whole spiel of, you know, KM bad, but I, I do think that this card feels very weirdly like it either does nothing or it does... I wouldn't say everything, but it, did, it does something. I'm not saying the effect's strong. When I first saw it, I thought it was strong. And then, you know, I basically did the same mental steps as Empty did, which just realizing, <laughs> oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait, it's minimal of one. And then I, and I thought about it. I'm like, I don't really know what deck that wants. Is. I mean, like, KM, sure, but I don't really think it supports anything specific in KM. It makes your scouts better, sure, but this is a one drop. I, I don't know how I feel about it, honestly. Well, I that, was, that was kind of the thing we were talking... I, I was thinking about, like, if the Black Rift deck were ever to be a thing, it kind of needs to just come out of surprise, right? Like, it just... Now, one thing it does need is this early drop that lowers the cost of the stuff it gets that's off Affinity. And so I originally proposed something that didn't turn out to work well. And this is kind of just an alternative to that proposal. And I think it's very neat. I mean, it's just a very sticky minor enchantment effect that gives a potential scout based or token based non-native deck what it needs and so i really like this design i did help with it uh disclaimer but um, yeah, i was a little bit surprised when i saw the new completely new player just brand new pop out with a non-native token that you made yourself i'm like hmm <laughs> <laughs> well there's so, so much was... your motive here yeah I'm making your chain. Yeah, I, I, I like the card. I, I like the card conceptually. I, and I, I was very, it, it's a nuanced card. I don't hate it. And that's yeah. a big accomplishment for it, for it with everything on this, uh, this card. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, the, the design, this, the design was basically all theirs. And I just kind of helped clean it up a little bit. I came up with a deck that would want it. Uh, so, summon. Because that generates a ton of stuff uh, off, like, there's the Lazabo that gives you time to duel and things. And it also <laughs> well, runs Fyra. Time to do is still one. But off Affinity Penalty, which this negates. Ah, uh, yeah. The main point. payoff, though, would be Fyra. Because you can, like, retrigger the summon and get four Fireballs. And then this Finally. will discount all of them down to one. Fire being relevant. Let's go. The cat does wonders. Okay, now the Psychida Distil Distiller is a um, one-drop spirit exclusive 1-1 one -one dealing from Sweatlo with summon, create a poison coating. Poison coating is a two-drop neutral, fast, give a unit deadly. So, fun. Uh, this is uh, obviously analogous sort of to uh, the Deadly Nightshade thing, but this has the added trick where if you want to kind of like store that summon proc for a later bigger unit or doing something with it afterwards, this lets you kind of build it up in advance. 
It's also fast, which means you could do some interesting surprises with, oh, I'm going to spring this on a duelist that I drop a couple turns later once you've forgotten I have this poison thingy and <laughs> make your life miserable. Um, what do we think of this? I'll let you go first, Empty. Uh, yeah, I think this card is quite good. Uh, it'll basically just replace Deadly Nightshade when that rotates out. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the benefit is that this is much harder to interact with because you can always guarantee at least one kill because uh, it gives fast. Uh, some of the things you can run this with, uh, like small duelists, like you were saying, uh, cough hand, the guide is another really good one. Oh my god. Because <laughs> that threatens to kill something every turn if they don't remove it, and you're always getting at least one kill. Mm -hmm. I, it's a really solid card. Yeah. What do you think, Spike? Um, well, I know Pop. I, I, I've been talking to Popka about this, and I know that they've been trying to push dealings off the ground. And I think this is like a for for post rotation. I think this is a solid card to be a clue right here. I just like it. Just it's one drop utility that you can play on turn one, and it'll just give you a card that you can bank at literally any single time while your opponent has to consider playing around the fact that they have this not not efficient. Well, not hyper efficient, I should put. This is no like blazing shuriken. Yeah. But uh, an efficient enough to like you have to put thought. And when they play this turn one, it's not going to be like Stickomancer turn one. I play my tokens and then I cry for five years. But it's it's a definitely a nice layer of nuance that I like it about. Well, yeah, De Deadly Nightshade did have the thing where you got two deadly units, so you had more potential to two for one off of it. This is more playing mind games with your opponent. And th for some people, they really like that aspect alone. And so I would say that's a big appeal of the card. It's definitely a side grade to Deadly Nightshade. I wouldn't call it worse or, or better. Um, but it definitely adds this whole new interesting dimension to it. I of feel course, like... Popka had to make it exclusive. This would be so good in the summon deck, but I can't run it in there. Well, you know Plopka's stance on uh, KM. I think everyone here knows Plopka's stance on KM. Well, to be fair, I think we need we should have a little bit more exclusive cards that aren't just, you know, the, the reason being KM bad. It's a useful tool that gives identity yeah. to the affinities. Yeah, so I said I wanted to highlight some newer designers, and this one is uh, Razbajnik, which I have been informed by the collective Polish community on the Discord sounds like a Polish name. Uh, although I don't think this user has actually shown up on the Discord yet, and this card is evidence why. Bursting Belly Walrus is a 5-drop neutral 3-2 zombie with Entombed, uh, Spawn, Intestine Snake, which is a 2-drop neutral 2-1 zombie with Adra. So, couple things. I, I wanted to take this moment to kind of like help workshop the card, because that's part of what we do here. Uh, we use Undead for the zombie type, because it's more general and it lets you create cooler uh, decks, obviously. Uh, we have a snake type. Um, I don't know what walrus would really go under, but yeah, this should be an undead snake. This should be an undead something else. Probably just walrus. walrus. <laughs> Do we have a walrus type? We I don't think. No. I don't think we need to justify it. It's, yeah, it's just undead walrus. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's a one-off card. Yeah. So this art style is like really, really cool and really, really interesting. And I wanted to see more of this, but not this, the art, but not the design around it. Um, oh, geez. so, uh, Spike, I'll let you talk on this one first. What do you think could be done to improve this thing? So first of all, I think the first thing that you probably want to do with this is probably drop this down by one or two stat points. Probably mm -hmm. this would probably be fine as a three drop to truth be told. Yeah. Just a, three, just a three drop three, two that like when it dies, it drops an agile. That seems pretty solid. Other than that, I think actually that design it's a little awkward with the fact that you have an Agile unit dropping off an Entomb because, you know, Entombs can happen over combat. So if you get the Bursting Belly Warriors dying in combat, you kind of sort of waste the Agile on that. But there's other ways of saying it, uh, of saving it. But like I said, I th maybe give the Intestine Agile uh, Snake, like, deadly or something, make it a 1-1. One -one. Yeah. Um, other than that, I love the art. Absolute. Love the art. I, I think it's absolutely gorgeous, and they did a wonderful, wonderful job, and I just want to highlight that. Change the tribal types, drop it down to three, maybe make the snake a 1-1 one, one deadly. That's that's my overview of the card. See, my solution was actually a little bit different. I was thinking maybe leave the uh, the cost and then just bump the Entomb up to create maybe two of these guys, maybe three. I could um, see it too. 
just to be a and so you're encouraged to actually find a way to like self sack pop the entomb come in with like a bunch of agile snakes you know uh what do you think empty yeah uh i think that if the like the cost is reduced this is great because yeah. uh, it's a natural fit in that like who's in tomb deck we were talking about earlier yeah and, like you play grave rave with this and then you have a snake and it already has agile so you can attack also small note it should be create an intestine snake if if this person happens to be watching this yeah so i mean basically the thing was come check out the discord we have a lot of people there who i'm sure would love to help workshop your card but um, as is, this card's a little too overcosted, and as it and as such, I mean, it's not doing very great on the thing currently. It's got three votes for some reason, which is actually pretty impressive that it's that far positive. Um, mostly because that art is gorgeous, and so I would love to see this design get cleaned up and resub. I would upvote it uh, after a little bit of rethinking, but as is, it's a little lackluster. Okay, now moving off uh, to Empty's picks with the Memory Download, which is a two-drop mind action from Mortstall, Realm of the Dead Things. Steal an action in your opponent's graveyard and make it mind. So Empty, why did you choose to pick, a, uh, pick this card today? Oh, I like this design for uh, like stealing things. Mm -hmm. I think it's really neat. Could be cool in like a mail deck or something. Uh, however, this current version I think is overcosted by one. It's like at two mana, you're like, you're not really gaining that much since you could just include, like, an action that would synergize normally with your deck. Yeah. The only thing you're really gaining is that you're playing two actions instead of one for, like, Rook passive, I guess. But I, I think it's a really cool design. Yeah, well, it's, C it's CA neutral, and you do get options. That's the thing. Yes. So if your opponent is running at least a couple uh, each of, well you know the the removal tools it needs or whatever you know you you get those options to pick between it but i, I could but see your argument <laughs> the downside is pretty big like yeah. let's say your opponent's running that intomb deck and their their one action is grave rave you don't want to steal that yeah yeah because if they're running something that's just really close to the chest and tight and only yeah uh, I see your pro what you're saying there is this is obviously very matchup dependent as any skill effect is going to be. But it could maybe help get you a nice good Vrick proc or something like that. Uh, what do you think of it, Spike? So I was actually talking with uh, Apra, who is a pretty big plant enthusiast and, and Marie enthusiast too, who basically brought up the point that, you know, Empty was bringing up that like depending on the matchup that it does nothing or does nothing relevant. And I mean, I, I do agree with it. I did argue with them that um, I, I, I did propose the argument that Marie is already in a weak, weak enough place right now that I think that this not affecting her is actually a benefit for her overall <laughs> hero design. But I do agree that it probably is a little bit overcosted. Um, one of the proposals for it uh, was Steal an actions in your opponent's graveyard if you can't draw a card. So it basically, if it can't hit anything, then it's just a cycle at that point, which I think is an interesting way of... So, uh, yeah, it, it being never a dead card, always being at least card advantage zero. I like that. Yeah. That's pretty much my... I, I was actually going to pick this myself, but somebody else already picked <laughs> to do it. I like, love the concept, love the idea of stealing opponent's graveyard, but admittedly, it is going to be in dead in certain matchups. Granted... Those those decks that are they are dead against are probably dead already. A, li a little bit a little bit on the weaker side. So. Yeah, like honestly, the Maria interaction is probably not something you're gonna run into very often. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, the Midnight Sleepwalker is a three drop neutral three three Dream Knight from the Genesis, designed by Grief, whoever that guy is. Always attacks. <laughs> And before combat, if this is exhausted, it has unblockable. So the idea with these Midnights were supposed to be that they synergize with self-exhaust, if I recall correctly. I heard him talk about it uh, before. I'm, um... And this seems interesting. First of all, we're seeing some dreams from the Realm of Nightmares, one of the Realms of Nightmares. Finally. And it gives you motivation to do a lot of interesting things. Um 
this is great with uh, Grave Rave, and you can run it in the Entombs deck because if you, after you pop your Grave Rave, you'll have this guaranteed uh, attacker. Um, found That's a really a creative way, way to yeah. use always attacks here, and I really like that. Uh, what do you think of this, Spike? Um, I, I love this card. I pretty much when I first saw it, I was just like, "Yep, this is it. This is a grief design." Um, it's definitely a little bit in the higher power level of things in my opinion not in a bad way though like this is more so like this is a form of healthy power creep it, I, i'd argue what where um where the previous options before for like neutral three drops that are three three are admittedly not high and also not very interesting so i think this is an interesting way to do uh rewards you for something that we really haven't seen before because self-exhaust isn't there was the rituals that happened like a couple of weeks back, but that never went anywhere. That got nerfed out of existence a little bit too much, reminder. But I think that this is a good like seed that you could plant for other people, be like, here's how we could probably like construct an entire deck around this. And I think this is a good start for yeah. introducing this mechanic. <clears throat> Yeah, one thing I do want to kind of note about this is very appropriately for a knight holding a double-edged sword, always attacks as a double-edged sword. Because um, the turn you drop this, a lot, if you're not ready, your opponent does have a chance to remove this via combat with maybe even little to no tempo loss. Um, and so they can keep you from ever getting that... Uh... Oh, because... Is that first turn considered yeah. exhausted? Mm -hmm. well, yep. Well, yep. First, first turn you play this, it's a free uh, three damage. Ooh, that's a little dicey. So yeah, yeah I guess this thing is that's... strong. This is but strong yeah, there card. there are ways you can slip this in and still kill it, unless your opponent has means to consider, or your the player playing it has means to consistently exhaust it. Cards like this give uh, rise to more utility for more bounce cards that we previously considered unplayable. Uh, not unplayable, but more so we nerfed them to the point of quote unquote unplayability. But now we can bring, like, unsummoning would be a good thing to bring against this card and stuff like that. That they care about, how, you know, play this turn three, it hits for three, that type of interaction that they care about. It's really good at Bullock and just a bunch of other decks that yeah. cares about just having a uninteract, quote unquote, uninteractable three, three that hits on turn three that you can swing with your other two units and get your proc. So really, really useful design. Yeah. What do you think of this empty? I think this is amazing design. One of the things I like so much about this card is that it's strong enough that if this whole right stack just like flops and doesn't work out, this card is still totally playable. Like getting it, having like three, uh, three, three, uh, always attacks that the first turn you play it, it's unblockable and swings for three. Like, that's already pretty good. I could see playing some, like, really all-in aggro decks. And it's, like, neutral reach. There's just so many good things about this card. Um, and then, like, of course, later on, once we get, like, that right synergy, you can have this right deck where this is, like, getting in every turn and you don't have to worry about exhausting it. Love this card. Great design. Still mad about the pun. Yeah. <laughs> Midnight, I'm mad. Okay, so let's talk about the Inguian Slasher, which is a three drop, four two Lizabo from Inguia with Overrun, Agile, and Frenzy 2. It's interesting because I also put, I saw another version of this that was at two, that was maybe a three one. Yeah, he resubbed it. Yeah. Oh, did he resub it in response to my howler being similar or what? I'm not exactly sure why he resubbed it, but I was also asleep last night, so... Okay, so let's talk about this version of the card. I think he remembered Lost Huntsman exists, and was like, oh shoot, we can't have this be a 3-1. Yeah, yeah. So, this is for the DC, over on Agile Frenzy 2. Guys, upvote DC cards. Even if you don't like them very much, they're extra slots, but only if we upvote them. Okay, a little bit of an exception here. Like we literally have over thirty entries right now, so maybe a little bit of discretion might be. But one of them out. needs to. But they still need to crack the bottom, t the the tenth card, and right now none of them are slated to. Hey, that's not true. Uh, Popka has won at like twenty four. Okay, we have one that's slated to actually crack crack the bottom. So, get yourself in order. Uh <laughs> 
Over on Agile Frenzy 2 gives us this nice little, it's going to run, it's got Agile and Strength, it's going to, uh, which I've always been a fan of. Um, it's just going to go smash face and take some things with it if they try to block. Uh, just a real consistent damage engine. Uh, what do we think of this? I'll let you start, Spike. This is um, this is pretty solid, like, three drop for Lizabo, which I don't really think have that many tools post-rotation. Like, they're going to be not losing all of their tools, but, like, a lot of their, like, made beef, like, the French vanillas here, like, they, they're, they're not going to have anything like that, to be fair. And I think this is very, very appropriately statted for what it is. And also, agile and strength, thank God, please. This makes sense. This perfectly makes sense. I, I already see people complaining about this should have summoned this attacks, which effectively the same thing. And I just... This is fine. If any any strength archetype should get agile, it should be Lizabo. They're small lizard people. They can run. Yeah. They're allowed to be agile. Well, I'll tell you why it shouldn't get some of this attacks. It's a DC submission. Yeah, well, um, yeah. obviously that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying as like agile. a normal card. As like a normal card, if somebody wanted to like update summon this attacks, I'd, I'd cry for five years. Yeah, empty. What do you think of this? Yeah, I agree with Spike. Uh, this DC is like a really good chance to fill in the uh, like that French vanilla slots for different tribes. And I think this is a great card to do that with. It's like it's actually well statted and would be like good to to play in a normal game because it's well, yeah. <laughs> well thought out. Yeah, just just guys, get 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 your votes together. Don't be so harsh. They're not competing with the regular slots. We just need them to crack the bottom or the tenth card. They are showing up strangely enough in Q, even though they said that they shouldn't have. They Plast should. I don't know would. why Plast said that because it always does. It always has. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Psycho Shock is an eight-drop mind action from nowhere in particular, designed by Entropic Mage. Your opponent banishes any amount of cards from their hand. They then take damage equal to the total mana cost in their hand. So this is like Mind Blow on steroids. Um, oh, no, because it gives them an opportunity to get rid of that because it's just gunk cards. Yes. So this would be, if it existed, kind of like a new spin on the Mind Blow thing. Uh, it's hard to really figure out what I think about this. Empty, uh, tell me what you thought when you were uh, picking this. Yeah, so the like the first version of this card costs five mana, which is way too little. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is like a bit too much. I could see it costing seven, but this is basically anti-control tech. Like if your opponent is hanging on to a bunch of like high cost stuff, you just drop this and they have to dump it. Because they're otherwise they're just gonna take obscene amounts of damage. Uh, I really like uh, a, like cards like this that give your opponent that choice of like, okay, how much damage do I want to take? How much can I take? Or and like, what do I need to hang on to, or I'm gonna lose? Uh, so I really like that about the design. I just think it's a little bit too overcosted. I do think it's interesting, although especially because it is in mind that it's. Uh, in particular, the mirror matchup. Because <laughs> control decks will that run a lot of, like, maybe run pair draw, each draw or something, are going to want to run this too. But when you slap this, it, it becomes a competition of who slaps this down first, right? <laughs> because if you're running the kind of player running stuff like Psycho Shock, then they have... And so that gives it this interesting almost... Another mind game on top of the mind game. Yeah, this is a really just quirky design from Entropic, and I love it. Um, what do you think, Spike? So the more I, I look at this card, I, I keep trying to, like, replay, like, little mini, like, games in my head of, like, where exactly when this would play and, like, when this would be, like, the most optimal. Because, obviously, if you play it against, like, a token deck or, like, a food deck, like, it's going to be, like, an annoying setback, but they're not going to banish their cards. <laughs> most of their cards are, like, one drops. But... This, I mean, this is a tech card through and through. Like, I, I don't really see many other decks this being effective against other than, like, 
decks that obviously hoard a bunch of like really high cost cards i'm thinking like you know obviously rictic but i do think it's a little bit like overcosted. seven's probably where it should be at or if you want my personal opinion six exclusive in mind <laughs> is, is my is my proposal for the for the cost is where it should sit because <laughs> i think that would be a really interesting tool to give to rictic while not you know being oppressive and also once again help solidify affinities by giving yeah. exclusive tools this is really interesting um it's interesting how well it's doing because it is uh sitting at rare it's got about 11 votes right now um so yeah, we'll really see, because um, this could be a very interesting rare to get in and kind of see what people will play with it. Um, I would love to hear stories about what this would actually like, how this would actually play out in two decks that were both running this, because um, that 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 sounds pretty uh, pretty exciting. Okay, the Firestar is a two-drop strength equipment from Yamato with permanently given ally in hand, entrance deal two damage to a unit. So this is like, okay, well, we're establishing this identity, identity via Kagamusha, designed, obviously, by the player who designed um, the Red Cloak Ronin, or Red Mask Ronin, or Red, Red Cloak Sword. Ronin. Red Sword, Blue Sword. Oh. <laughs> the Matrix guy. Um, of course, this doesn't synergize with Kagamusha itself, but... No, <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. No. But it, it builds more on that kind of design space of having entrance-based samurai um or just samurai that want to get played you know uh so spike i'll let you go first on this yeah so i i I remember when this card was being designed that like literally the idea for it was um and this is actually still in progress uh acoustic is a champion and he actually is trying to currently update kagamusha to work with uh modifications which is if anyone who's ever like messed with blocking knows how much of a nightmare that is how much of an absolute nightmare to create an absolute perfect copy but well yeah obviously (laughs) you can you you can't but i am assuming there's going to be some jerry ringing and i just wish the best luck but for as for this card itself i actually love this design i think uh one of my favorite is types of archetypes which i don't really see done at all hearthstone did it like very weakly and i don't really agree with how they did it um is hand buff (laughs) Um, obviously by the fact that we're a digital card game, we can get away with doing, you know, stuff like this with Firestar. And I think that this would be a really cool, just really tiny, like sniping removal for strength while still tying the idea of the direct damage coming from a unit. Cause I feel like people are apprehensive to giving strength direct, you know, direct burn, unless it's like, you know, keyed off of a unit, like, you know. Blazing Shurikens keys off attack and stuff like that. So I think this is a... By the way, Blazing Shurikens Firestar. Yeah, I did think it's funny that this is a Blazing Shuriken <laughs> that does a different thing. Um, really cool effect. Love that it's permanent. Yeah, what do you think, Captain? I mean, I I definitely think at some point there's going to be a way to like abuse this. Deadlies. Deadly yeah. units. I mean, that that's the obvious one. But, like, imagine, like, some sort of, like, if you get any sort of bounce chain going, like uh, how old King Loop used to work. Yeah. Like, you can use this to clear the opponent's board. The other thing that this could be relevant in is, uh, like, spirit equipment, because that deck runs a lot of deadlies. Um, and just, honestly, just, like, scouting this randomly... <laughs> Off your uh, junkyard duchess will uh, pay out a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still, it's still is slow though. You have to consider that, like, you have to have something in your hand in the first place. Yeah, that, that's the thing. Well, I do like this a lot more than like uh, Huntsman's Bow in that deck, for example, because like Huntsman's Bow, it's like the unit is already in play, and like you're buffing it up, and then you can return the bow over and over again. Uh, that that was a huge pin, so I'm kind of glad that's going away. Uh, this will be a lot more interesting because, like, you have to have the unit in hand, of course. Um, so if you're returning this over and over again, which you still can do, you have to put all the buffs on that one unit and then like play it and have like a whole bunch of fire stars going everywhere. Plus, bouncing neat. is b- bouncing is obviously not strength. 
with strength yeah. against affinity. So you it, like almost all the examples you described, all of them just sounds like just KM shenanigans to me. Oh yeah, the KM shenanigans are gonna be real with this card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I like this kind of card, and it, it's 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 an interesting like synergy combo thing. So I, I'm definitely for it. Um, so over to Spike's pick, starting with the Scarlet Stabtician, which is a one-drop strength, one-two vampire scientist from Mortstall, Realm of the Dead Things. Active, give an ally unit plus two HP and deal one damage to it. So this is a great uh, rage synergy, mostly, um, where this is your guy who does your poking, and you're poking, and it, and it, makes, it gets bigger, actually, in the process, but it just uh, provides you a bunch of rage triggers. I don't think this is going to push Gambuuru into the meta. Um, so I'm already just heartbroken about this card. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm is just Gambaru kidding. Uh, rotating? I don't even know if Gambaru is rotating. Gambaru two reborn. I gotta He's look this now. up. <laughs> Undead koala kaiju is which I feel like go. the most. You can most Gambaru is gone. Gambaru is gone. Ah. Yeah, it, it's funny. Like a whole bunch of people are like, "Oh man, Gambaru is so strong." Never saw play once in the old year it was in standard. I'm ready for Gamburo Reborn. Make five airplanes. <laughs> I'm ready. Gamburo Reborn is just even worse than the original. Stranger, this is not mocking you, by the way. This is signs for you that people care about the kaiju thing and you should design more for it, by the way. Yes, please. I please. love kaiju. Please. They're this so is not cool. mocking you. This is a compliment. People are talking about your card. Spike, uh, why'd you pick this? Talk about it. Um, so I actually really, I, I think Rage is super, super, super unrepresented in our game. We have plenty of, I think we have enough Rage enablers now, especially with last week's cards that we got. And, um, but we don't really have like efficient ways of like enabling them. Like Acid Rain doesn't exist. In, it's not going to exist post rotation. Not that you would, not sure if you would run that, but we don't really just have that many ways of, we have self sack, but we don't have self damage, and that's that that's the caveat. And I think like a unit like this that's innocuous on its own. If you play it turn one, your opponent may or may not removal depending on how good the the rage deck is at the moment. But if it's if if it's tame, and I think this is tame, I think this will just sit down and just get you just occasional value. Yeah. What do you think of this, Empty? I think this card is nutty. I think this is absolutely ridiculous. The problem is you can go this turn one and then turn two, you play Bright Blade and then active this onto the Bright Blade oh, and you win. Right, right, the game's right. over. You, you just won. Because that is so ridiculous. Because probably... now you're heralding so much every turn. You just herald two and you're going to herald three next turn unless they remove your stuff. And you still have this Bright Blade sitting there that's threatening to herald more. And it's at four HP now. Yeah. I, so I think, maybe, I think maybe you just tweak this, like maybe just make it one HP and deal one damage to it, so it's not like a positive buff. Or the one thing I thought of for rage way. enabler is maybe just like deal one damage to a unit, heal it to full. So it has to have at least two HP to start, and That's you could also use it as like strength. a regen attack or something. Yeah, I really I think the only like. Like that combo of uh, this turn one and then uh, Bright Blade turn two is always going to be really strong. Uh, I think the thing that really breaks it is that you're pumping up its HP every turn. Yeah. The one I think net if, you, gain, if you remove that, it'll probably be fine. The net gain is enough to make it difficult, but we're probably going to see that that's probably going to come in an update. This is already sitting at 14 because it's another one of those just really great cornmeal designs. So, yeah. <laughs> Get ready, folks. We'll make Rage decks viable if it gets in. <laughs> I'll give it that. It's also funny that there, uh, he posted that one week before the uh, archetype completion is. Yeah. They're doing their whole Rage gym. Yeah. Uh, the Volcanic Drake is a five drop strength, four, four elemental dragon from nowhere in particular, with flying and deal four damage to the first unit your opponent plays each turn. Ouch, that is scary. For a lot of decks that are kind of in the middle of units, that's basically locking you out until you can remove this. 
even some things that are like dualisty, that is, whew. Am I right to be, uh, uh, am I reasonable being afraid of this? I'll let em Empty talk first. Um, sort of. Like it can sort of lock you down. Uh, aggro don't care though. Aggro don't care. Totally and don't that care. that's the main thing. This is only really great against like mid range, which there isn't too much of. Um, and of course it comes down turn five. So by then, like most of the time you can already develop the board. There is like some potential for like a stacks sort of style deck where you like you have this in play and your opponent just can't play units and everything is small. Well, it'd be the uh, first like, unit. You still get uh, summons and like intombs and things off that yeah. first unit too. So I think it's fine. What do you think, Spike? So when I first picked this card, um, first uh, first of all, I want to shout out to uh, uh, VM Nunez coming back and posting designs. Always happy to see. First it was Grief posting cards again, and now you know VM posting cards really warms the cackles of my soul. But um, I really don't think this design is as impressive as it looks. I th I thought it was when I first looked at it, and then I thought about it, and well, like Empty said, aggro don't care. Aggro gonna play their one drop, and it's gonna tank the four damage, and then they're gonna play you know whatever after with. Food probably wouldn't care about it because they'll. You know, probably they'll feed out of the range of uh, of oh, the. Food would the, love to play against this because you drop your egg and this burns it for oh, you. Oh no! <laughs> um, rage decks wouldn't mind playing against this, obviously, because you know it would proc the rage. It's still not good. Four damage is a lot. Like yeah, you, that that's and that's what I think is is the cool thing about it is that while four is just enough to be prohibitive that you know you have to really think about the first unit you're going to be playing it's not prohibitive enough that like when you're getting on the late game four damage is a lot yeah sure but if it's not outright killing something you're still getting your value off of it and plus it's only four hp it dies to an electrolyze i honestly yeah. think that i would have preferred seeing this design it too and it just kind of cooks the unit right like it just sets you up so you still have to like lay up for your kills but that's me. Um, I would have liked this dealing a little bit less, but so you still have to work to kill a lot of stuff, but because as is, this just seems really, really, I mean, even if it just looks really, really scary, uh, that's probably why it's only doing about five at, on, on the Reddit right now. But I understand what you guys are saying that really there's a lot of decks in the current meta that have means to play around this. So this is obviously a very meta dependent type deal. Yeah, oh. I just wanted to I just wanted to illustrate that while while initially it might look scary that if you if you take the time to you know play it out in your head, you could probably the effect can be pretty negated pretty easily. Not all decks, my yeah. This will hose some decks for sure. Yeah. Well, and another thing that like I quite like about this card is that if you know your opponent's running it, like you can plan ahead for this. Yeah. Like if you just save one of your one drops for a while, uh until your opponent plays the volcanic drake, when you can have a free insurance policy. It's like, yeah. So yeah, interesting roll roll in dragons. Um, you guys are saying it's more on the balance side. I say, yikes, but maybe it's not as yikes as I thought before. So. Okay, the blood oil phantom is a three drop strength two three robot vampire from Mortstall, realm of the dead things. Coming at you from Submitted for Your Approval, which is the PR department for cornmeal. No, just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. It I'm just, I'm just feels that fun. Way. I love you, corn. If you're watching this, don't. It's don't... even a corn design. <laughs> this, yeah, that's. The, I've been. I, I. I specifically picked all of my designs to have a completely different creator. It just happened. This one also happened to be from Morstall. Anyways, this is a cannibals design. Oh, this is a cannibals design. Yeah, that's why I picked it. Interesting. Where's I should have had the stranger. He actually did a great job at impersonating the art style, by the way, because it looked like a corn art. Um, a robot vampire flying overrun, and when you play a unit, if it has more attack than this, give this plus one plus one. Otherwise, herald two. Oh, joy. So this is a scaling flyer that wants you to just dump out a whole bunch of units and can really... This is like a strength swarm card. Um, 
What do you, uh, I want to talk to obviously the uh, be very very careful about units that scale guy first empty uh, go. Hmm. Uh, I think this is fine scaling. It's like it it's very limited on how much attack it can gain before you start heralding, mm -hmm. and heralding is quite a bit worse. Um, obviously, like there are some scaling herald units in the game now that like herald equal to their attack. So that can become scary. But compared to stuff like uh, the uh, constructor that we just got nerfed the other week, like this is nothing. Um, I think it's totally fine. Well, the thing you got to do note about that herald effect is that if you are the kind of person who's dropping multiple units on a turn, you're going to herald that thing out of the range of Blood Oil's ability possibly. Yeah. So, so it's like the, the herald effect can play into the plus one, plus one effect. And that's they can just kind of weave yeah. through like that. Yeah, it's, it's part of the value engine, really. Really, I, I, I picked this card mostly because I just wanted to point out that I I think it might be overstatted by, like, a single point or even half a point. Like, I don't, I personally don't think it needs overrun. I think flying is already enough of an evasion keyword on top of this, and I feel like... That's weird. I, I, I get it. I get that it's a big fly... It... it, 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 it that you need to have overrun with a unit that's getting big stats, but actually, I think the flying does that enough, is my opinion. If this, gets yeah, game, the, the I would probably just cut the overrun. Double evasion is just weird. Um, it's for MTG. Yeah, I mean the thing is, I'm kind of like comparing this to the scaling units we have currently in standard, uh, which this is like nothing compared to those. Uh, but obviously, post rotation, the meta could look a lot different, and this could end up being really scary. It's like if this I, sticks around yeah. for a while, like it scales itself, and then it's going to start scaling your deck, which in turn lets it scale more. So it could become quite threatening. Yeah, and this I think is kind of like the nail in the coffin for really having strength be. Now we didn't have a lot of like swarm designs in strength before the vampires really started popping up, right? And yeah. now this is solidifying that Swarm is just something that all three affinities have. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see what's done with this. The Vampire Tribe is super relevant here, and I think we need to yeah, stop for a moment is. and be like, oh, how bad is this going to get? But it doesn't have Life Bond or anything, so I think this yeah. is balanced. I think the overrun is overkill, which is kind of predictable. It is. <laughs> but... Sorry I misattributed this card earlier. Um, the art, by the way, is stellar. I really do like it. It's simple, clean, and beautiful. <sighs> so, yeah, I'd be interested. I'd upvote this. Um, it's not actually doing that well, and I don't really know why. It's doing about it as well as some of the French vanilla stuff. Probably because people are scared of vampires, rightfully it was, so. It was also literally like posted like a couple of minutes after the DC announcement. So okay. I probably got buried uh, by like all the D DC right there, which is okay. part of the Speaking part of, of my selection DC, process. Vote those cards up, or we aren't going to fill our three slots, guys. Um, I think that's it uh, for the sub, so I'm going to close out the share. So this was good. Um, grief should be back soon. I forgot to ask him, so I we will him. see. Um, I know me and Empty will definitely be here next week. And if not, we'll have another nice another guest for you. So there's that. Um, I'm thinking about starting up a conversation probably somewhere on the Discord about what you guys want us to do with our guest policy. So keep an eye out for that. If I post like a Google form or something, I'll have the link in the description. I haven't decided on it yet. So just keep an eye out for that. Uh, thank you as always uh, to Empty Folder for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks, Spike, for coming out again. It's always really fun to have you over. Cheers, and I just want to say that I, I, I've been loving seeing the community grow. I, you know, it's it's slow, mostly because, you know, <laughs> I've been yeah. quiet about it. But I, I ever since, you know, I, ever since I first came on here, I've seen plenty of people come in and go right there. And it's it's really nice seeing a bunch of old people, new people. This, yeah. You know, like Thrifty Fishing came back ever since I, I left. And then seeing everyone just like freak out over, it's like, hey, Thrifty's back. You know, it, it makes me feel warm. So yeah, we're a, yeah, we're a family, and it's good that we're getting we're getting more people together. It's our little Christmas miracle. Um, 
So yeah, uh, for those who are new to the game, uh, keep an eye on the Discord. That's where we do so much chatting, so much uh, workshopping cards and stuff like that. Uh, for those new players that I made sure to highlight, we would love to take a look at your stuff. Just come talk to us. Um, like, comment, and subscribe. Remind me why I'm doing this. And keep on playing collective and keep on voting on cards. Bye! Peace.